Or is it? Uh, yeah, we got to get started. Uh, okay. It's a little bit louder. Yeah. Okay. See if that's a little brighter. Can you make it a little brighter? No, no. but I can do that. Yeah. That's okay. No, I'm fine. <laughs> Do you want the headphones? No. Uh, okay, uh, we're gonna get started. Uh, this is a book presentation uh, with uh, Jonathan Singerton, Dr. Jonathan Singerton, uh, on his book, The American Revolution and the Habsburg Monarchy. I have a copy here, <laughs> didn't even show. Uh, anyway, published by the University of Virginia Press, so a prominent American publisher. And we are pleased to have Dr. Singerton on this uh, uh, Zoom call from uh, Innsbruck, from the University of Innsbruck, where he currently teaches. So let me, the way we're gonna go about this, I'll briefly introduce him. And then uh, he will give a, a, a pre a summary of his book, a half an hour, 35 minutes. And then we're gonna open it up for questions. Uh, so uh, let me get started then. So. Uh, Jonathan received his PhD in history from the University of Edinburgh in 2018 and was awarded uh, the university's Jeremiah Dalziel Prize in British history. I was surprised in British history. I mean, this could be American history, this could be European history. I didn't really think of it so much as British history, but it's okay. So for his research on Central Europe's global connections uh, uh, he received a number of different fellowships, including from the Botsteber Foundation. He was a fellow at the Institute of Habsburg Studies uh, at the Austrian Academy of Sciences in Vienna. And now he is currently a lecturer and research fellow at the University of Innsbruck. Uh, and as far as I know, he is working on a biography of an Austrian immigrant to the United States named Maria von Born. He might mention her today. And I know he is also working on a project that is funded again by the Botsdieper Foundation uh, uh, on uh, the Leopoldine Society. Uh, this I find interesting because the Leopoldine Society in the 19th century sent missionaries, particularly to the Midwest. And uh, in many parishes in Wisconsin and Michigan and Minnesota, places like that, the, essentially the, uh, the parishes were often founded by these missionaries. Uh, uh, some of them were from the Wilton Abbey in Innsbruck. So if you think about those connections, I find that quite interesting. Uh, I was most impressed by the research of his book, and I yesterday took the pain of counting uh, and he actually worked in 26 different archives around the world. And that is plus seven British archives plus 18 American archives. So altogether that would make it 50 in 12 different countries. And for his research, he used 11 different languages, among them Hungarian, Czech, Slovak, Croatian, and Swedish. Next, of course, German, English, and French, the usual, you could say. So I thought uh, that was extremely impressive in terms of his research. So he must have traveled Europe and the world for quite a while to finish his dissertation and his book. But he will now tell us uh, from his perch in Innsbruck what the book is all about. So Jonathan, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction and the uh, kind words there about the book. And indeed, it was a, a very good labor of love to uh, travel to those archives. And as you rightly said, I was funded um, significantly by the Botchdeeper Foundation. And without their support, it would not have been possible uh, to, uh, to do all of that research. I hope the um, microphone and everything uh, is fine. I would like to share my screen, um, but I need the permission to do that. So could someone give me the- uh, okay, Can you give them the permission? The admin code, yeah. I'm not sure how you do that. Um, normally, it's, it's whoever's link it is can make me an admin, but uh, yeah. The permission, wait, 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 let's ask Mark. Yeah, I don't know. Tell Mark to come. 
One sec, Jonathan, we get that now. Mm -hmm. Why don't you give him permission? Okay. Oh, chair. <laughs> Okay, now it should work. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, great. I see. Now, okay, thank you very much again, Mark, and uh, for everybody's patience. So hopefully you now all see the, uh, the slides on, uh, on the screen. Do you see the full version, I hope? Yeah. Okay, good. So uh, again, yes, uh, my talk today is about the American Revolution and the Hapsa Monarchy. It is based upon my book of the same title, which um, I was going to point it out, was published at the end of last year at the University of Virginia Press. Uh, it's available for free download, so you can uh, simply access it as an open access version to read uh, if you so wish. Um, I begin then first of all with just a, a brief um, slide about the contents of the book so people can uh, see this and see what kind of topics are contained within the book. But briefly stated, the book charts the meaning of the American Revolution for the Habsburg dynasty um, and the meaning of the Habsburg dynasty within the American Revolution. Uh, it does so by uh, looking at particular strands and themes within uh, the American Revolution. And it also goes from uh, even before the revolution, from uh, the time of Columbus up to the revolution and then beyond um, into the 1790s and into the early 19th century to explain the meaning of America for the Habsburg monarchy and also vice versa, the meaning and importance of the Habsburg monarchy for the new American Republic. So uh, in today's talk, then I'm going to uh, not talk about the entirety of the book, uh, that would be rather impossible uh, given the uh, 30 minutes or so. Uh, instead, I'm going to present what I think are particular uh, important themes and then based on that uh, particular highlights from the book. I thought I'd start, first of all, um, without knowing the audience, I thought I'd start with uh, a map to orientate ourselves spatially. I'm sure that many of you are aware of uh, Austria-Hungary and the Habsburg monarchy before it and have a good idea of uh, what these places were and what they looked like at the time. But this map serves just as a quick refresher then of the Habsburg monarchy and its lands at the time of the American Revolution. So an important thing to uh, note is that as Gunter pointed out about my uh, archival work, is that I set upon the mission to write about the Habsburg monarchy in its totality. I did not want to write a history of the American Revolution and Austria or a history of the American Revolution and Vienna. I very much wanted to include all parts of the monarchy as best I could and to represent all of these stories in one holistic picture. So it's for that reason then that uh, of course, uh, multilingual work as well as um, deep archival work across Europe and across North America was needed for this. It's for the same reason then uh, that Tuscany, you see at the bottom uh, middle of the map, uh, is also included within the book. It's something I won't uh, dwell upon too much tonight, but Tuscany plays an important part in this story as it was ruled by the emperor's younger brother um, under terms of second genitor. So it has a, a big influence in uh, the American Revolution and the Habsburg's position towards uh, America. The same then goes for uh, modern day Belgium, uh, the Austrian Netherlands, it's located up in the top left hand corner of the map. Uh, this also will become an important site uh, for our talk and for our journey tonight as well. So um, beginning then the first of three themes, I thought to break down the book into what I see are three core themes, uh, three uh, meanings of the American Revolution for the Habsburgs. Uh, the first of these is diplomacy. So to think about the relationship, the diplomatic and political relationship that emerges between the Habsburgs and uh, the Americans during this time, but also a relationship that sort of uh, is stillborn, one that doesn't uh, necessarily uh, become official in any way. Uh, it's not until uh, the early 19th century in 1828 and then later in 1838 that uh, the Habsburgs, um, Austria, the Austrian Empire, forms an official relationship with the United States. But our story and the, I argue, the uh, true diplomatic relationship between the Habsburgs and uh, America begins much earlier, uh, 60 or 50 years earlier, uh, in the time of the revolution with this man here, William Lee. Now, Lee is a member of the famous Lee dynasty of Virginia, the same as uh, the Confederate General Robert E. Lee. 
and it is uh, unfortunately Robert, uh, so it's unfortunately William Lee's task to be the envoy to uh, Vienna during the American Revolution. He is chosen by Congress due to his um, family's influence, and he's not chosen because of ability. Uh, he doesn't speak any French, and he speaks almost no uh, German either, so he has no linguistic capabilities for this role. Instead, he is a merchant by training who had lived in London up until the revolution and then found himself in uh, France uh, on the eve of uh, his commission to Vienna. Lee travels to Vienna in 1778. His mission is simple. It is to uh, broker some kind of contact with the uh, Habsburg court to potentially get their aid in terms of material and arms um, but also possibly to agree to a treaty of commerce or a treaty of amity between the two nations. And thirdly, to try and stop the flow of Hessian mercenaries to America. So you have to remember, of course, at that time that the Habsburgs were also the head of the Holy Roman Empire, which contained uh, the Hessian territories. And this is where Britain sourced many of these um, mercenary soldiers to fight in the American Revolution. So the Americans, congressmen and so on, thought that the Habsburgs would have the power to halt this flow of mercenaries. So Lee's mission was very important in the early stages of the war. It's again unfortunate, as I said, that they chose Lee um, because of his lack of ability and suitability. Um, this meant that he depended heavily upon the French ambassador in Vienna for his uh, success at court. And although the ambassador was very uh, experienced, he unfortunately made a number of blunders quite early on. Uh, so Lee was presented at the same time as British guests uh, to uh, the court, and this uh, caused quite a, a sort of diplomatic scuffle. Uh, at the same time, Lee uh, was not welcome at the court. Um, they had promised the British that, that Lee would not be received um, because the Habsburgs were very keen not to disturb the neutrality and the tranquility of Europe at this time. They were very afraid of taking sides very early on in the war. So Lee's mission was rather badly timed. It was then also um, unfortunate that he had to rely so much on the French ambassador. And so it's for those reasons mainly that his mission fails and the sort of first um, diplomatic initiative then between these two states fails uh, almost immediately. At the same time, however, it's important to say that Lee, uh, Lee had some success uh, he became quite a celebrity in Vienna. He was invited to many uh, dinner parties, many soirees and uh, salons, and he became something of a, a sort of American uh, celebrity during his short stay in Vienna. And this helped, of course, embed more deeply the American cause in Vienna uh, in 1778. Uh, turning now to the uh, end of the American Revolution uh, in 1783, or the end of the war in 1783, uh, the tables have turned somewhat. So it is now the uh, impetus of the Habsburgs to broker relations with, the, with America, with the new uh, United and Sovereign Republic in America. And uh, for this, they uh, choose this man, Baron Frederick Eugene de Bélin Berthoff, to be a commercial advisor. Now, Berthoff is a uh, mid ranking uh, bureaucrat in uh, Brussels, uh, but he is sent there as a commercial advisor to secure trade between uh, America and the Habsburg lands. So after the American Revolution is over, many European countries rush to uh, open up trading links with the United States, and Balin Berthoff is sent as the, uh, the eyes on the ground, as it were. He is sent as the main agent of the emperor to help secure these ties and find out new possibilities for trade uh, in the 1780s. Balin Berthoff is a very uh, successful diplomat in this sense. He meets many members of Congress. He is treated pretty much the same as an ambassador alongside other European ambassadors. Um, he also files numerous reports, around 1,500 handwritten pages in total. And if you go to the archives in Vienna today and you see the boxes with these reports, they would stack up to uh, the height of a human. They are rather voluminous in total. So uh, Balin Berthoff certainly provided a lot of information on American commerce and the economy, but also on its society and its culture and its politics. And these reports are very interesting and very detailed um, among European sources on early America. The next slide uh, shows an image of George Washington. Uh, this is sketched by his son. And I put this here as a reminder, not only to show that Balin moved there with his family uh, to America, but also that um, Balin and his family were rather enamored with the new American Republic. Uh, they owned land, they acquired property, 
and they in, in the end uh, settled in the United States rather than return after the end of his mission. And so they became uh, rather sort of avid American supporters in that sense. And Balin Biltoff uh, died in 1808 of uh, a fever of uh, a sort of epidemic at the time. And he was buried in a church that he had built uh, in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Uh, he was indeed buried by enslaved people. So the first uh, representative of the Hudson monarchy was buried by enslaved people uh, in the United States. Finally, um, one of the important things to mention is not only his impact in terms of information about the United States, but also his interest in Native Americans. Uh, Balin Bertoff in lots of uh, reports mentioned the conditions of Native Americans in uh, the 1780s, and he was particularly keen on brokering new connections, new trading connections, new political connections with Native Americans uh, on behalf of the Habsburgs. Uh, it's for this reason that he included this image of a Muskie Creek uh, warrior and leader, uh, and one that he equated with the role of emperor. So he describes the uh, political system of the Muskie Creek as being similar to the Holy Roman Empire. And in 1785, he travels to New York to meet with another nation, uh, the Oneida Nation, a delegation of Oneida, uh, to possibly discuss uh, treaties and trade with them. And he indeed um, helps other representatives of uh, Habsburg merchants to broker contacts with the Native Americans. Now, sadly, these um, initiatives don't uh, amount to much. They don't uh, end in any great treaty or anything like this. But it shows very much the broader interest of the Habsburg monarchy in North America, as well as then these uh, deeper understandings of uh, Native America and um, in the Habsburg lands at the end of the 18th century. It's a very interesting connection to pursue. All of this, of course, has to deal with my next theme, which is commerce and the uh, role of trade within the American Revolution and perhaps the exposition in the American Revolution. This, of course, is a major theme throughout the book. Uh, I devote a lot of time to discussing uh, how trade gave the impetus behind diplomatic ventures and how trade was really fundamental to uh, the emerging uh, role of the Habsburgs in the American Revolution. The first slide here now shows uh, the Austrian Netherlands again uh, in more detail from the map that you've seen before. Um, if I draw your attention to the Austrian Netherlands on the left, you see the Austrian Netherlands are colored in the dark gray and they are bisected by the light gray area um, towards the right of the map. That light gray area is the Prince Bishopric of Liege. Uh, Liège at that time is an independent uh, state within the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, it is not under control of the Habsburgs, it's under control of a prince bishop. Um, but the important thing to know about Liège is it is essentially one of the major gunpowder and weapon manufacturing areas of Europe. So it is the place in Europe where um, guns, the cannons, cannonballs, weapons like pistols and rifles and so on are produced. And many uh, belligerents in the war source their uh, weaponry from Liège. It is known for its good quality, and it is, a, of course, a, a neutral state. Now, if you're an American rebel in 1775 and uh, in 1776 as well, when the British have effectively uh, taken over the gunpowder uh, producing areas in the colonies, you will need to source foreign weapons and foreign sources of gunpowder. So the Americans immediately turn to places like Liège for their weaponry in the fight against Great Britain. Now, in the early part of the war, this weaponry is uh, traded out of Liège along the rivers you see on the map, the Meuse and the Sabre River, uh, down to France. But once France enters the war in 1778, that avenue is largely closed off because French ships are now not neutral any, anymore and are susceptible to British attack. And then the same occurs in 1780 when the Dutch enter a separate war against Britain, the Fourth Anglo-Dutch War, and Dutch shipping comes under British attack as well. So uh, weaponry from Liège, especially from 1780, then travels along the river network uh, across to um, Kent and then further on to Ostende. Uh, it's lucky and very fortunate at this time that there is a major canal network that has just been completed on the eve of the revolution that allows uh, Liège arms to be brought from Liège over to Ostend uh, through the Austrian Netherlands. And it's for that reason then that the uh, coffers, the, the income as such of the Habsburgs in the Austrian Netherlands uh, rather explodes because of the amount of trade uh, in uh, arms and arm 
arms deals uh, in the Austrian Netherlands. Ostend, as you see depicted on the right, uh, is a, a small maritime port on the North Sea, and its importance again takes off in the 1780s when it becomes effectively the uh, sole neutral port on the North Sea. So if you remember, uh, Britain is at war with France, as well as the Dutch public, and then also from 1779, the Spanish as well. So Ostend is really one of the only major uh, neutral ports uh, from uh, the middle point of the War of Independence. And for that reason, many foreign nations use Ostend for their uh, trade. They send their ships there to be registered. They use the Habsburg uh, naval flag um, as a cover against attack from other belligerent powers. And so Ostend goes from around 480 ships per year uh, during the early years of the war uh, to over 3,000 ships per year uh, entering and leaving its harbor. That's how big this trade is. Uh, they tear down part of the walls to accommodate this. And even a new verb uh, in, uh, in Dutch and in German is created, Ostendizieren, uh, to Ostendize your ship, uh, to mask your ship, in other words, with the Habsburg flag, because it's that important. Uh, I should also say then Ostend is really that lifeline for uh, not only uh, the American uh, traders and French traders and Dutch traders, but also for the British. Um, so Ostend uh, ships as such, uh, ships that are nominally Ostend ships, uh, sail to the Caribbean to keep the Caribbean afloat uh, financially. They sail to North America to take arms and weapons and goods there as well. They are used practically by every major belligerent in the war, and it becomes a real important hub uh, throughout the American Revolutionary era. The same cannot be said, sadly, for uh, Trieste, uh, the other major port of the Habsburg monarchy. Uh, you see it highlighted on the map on the left uh, with the red arrow. Uh, the important thing to note about Trieste is that it, for a long time, has become the major entreport of the Austrian lands. So starting in the early 18th century, the idea was to build Trieste up as the main export hub for Austrian goods, to bring those goods down from Styria and Lower Austria and Bohemia and to use Trieste as the major um, hub of the monarchy for trade to the Mediterranean and beyond. Uh, by the time of the American Revolution, then uh, Trieste has uh, a good deal of infrastructure and capability to trade with the wider Mediterranean and even the wider world. On the next slide, you see then uh, a quote by an inhabitant of Trieste, uh, Christoph Beller. He is a military commander in Trieste. Uh, and he writes a petition to uh, the Treasury, to the uh, financial department of that sort of government uh, in 1776, you know, just at the time that the American Declaration of Independence is reaching um, the Habsburg monarchy. And he writes that the current situation of the English colonies in America seems to merit considerable attention, and more than ever before to have commerce which has made especially the Dutch and English so rich and respectable. And I include that quote because it shows already this understanding in 1776 by Triestine merchants and inhabitants that American uh, commerce will make them rich, that it is an opportunity, in other words. Now, the reason that they believe this is because the monopoly held by the British over American goods has now ended. America has declared an end to that by proclaiming their independence, and they are free to trade with the rest of the world. So there's already this clamor in Trieste to trade with uh, North America and the United States. Uh, this echo, I'm oh, sorry, this crescendo of, um, of uh, petitions and uh, voices for trade with America reaches its peak then around 1782, when the Hofkammer, the Treasury, allow uh, the first voyages to uh, America, to the United States, in fact. The first ship, aptly named the Americano, leaves Trieste uh, in 1782, and it is a resounding success. It brings back sugar and tobacco and uh, indigo, typical American staples, um, and these are traded for uh, Central European staples, mainly iron and uh, manufactured goods, as well as linens and textiles and glass and so on like this. So uh, this trade proves quite vital, and within 12 months of this first voyage in 1783, uh, a new company, the Austrian-American Trading Company, is founded in Trieste to 
really secure and develop this transatlantic trade. Uh, and in this time, 1783, 1784, uh, Trieste establishes links then not only with Philadelphia in, in the United States, but also with Baltimore and Savannah and other um, major uh, American ports. It becomes such an important uh, sort of trading line that it outshadows the profits made by the voyages to India and China by perhaps merchants during the same period. And it becomes the most valuable uh, trading line outside of the Mediterranean for Triestine merchants. So it is again a very significant and very um, quick and quickly developing uh, avenue for trade. It all comes to uh, an abrupt end in by the late uh, 1780s, both here in Trieste as well as in Ostend. And this is largely due to the fact that uh, Hafsburg merchants have not got a treaty of amity and commerce with Americans. So in effect, they cannot compete against other nations that have such reduced tariffs and such favorable treaty terms. And the reason that they uh, do not have such a treaty in Hapsburg monarchy is due to the man on the left, uh, Thomas Jefferson. Now, Jefferson has a particular vision for uh, post-war America. He sees America as a country based mainly on an agrarian economy, an economy of farmers, and he sees international trade as something not entirely desirous. And he also sees it as something that should be limited to the neighboring countries or to the uh, Atlantic powers. This is really um, the reason that he then has no space uh, in his mind for a treaty with the Habsburgs. And this is the argument put forward, uh, not just by myself, but another great uh, scholar of this uh, particular topic, um, Chara Livoy in uh, Debitsin. However, I don't find this um, argument entirely sufficient because Jefferson in the same period signs a treaty with Prussia. And of course, we all know Prussia has no colonies in the Caribbean or in, you know, in the Atlantic world. And so my question really is then, if not the Habsburgs, then why Prussia? And I think the more robust and uh, full uh, explanation can be found in Jefferson's views of the man on the right, uh, namely the Emperor Joseph II. Uh, during this period, Joseph II embarks on many um, fantastical diplomatic escapades. Uh, he has a major alliance reversal with Russia. He goes to war later with the Turks. Uh, he leads um, himself into a, a very short-lived war with the Dutch Republic. And he is seen as a rather maverick um, foreign policy leader, in a sense. And Jefferson, who had a rather negative view of uh, Joseph in this time, has an even worse view of his foreign policy. So he sees him as a rather unstable leader and a non-trustworthy uh, individual as a potential ally and trading partner. So it's for this reason as well that Jefferson uh, does not, avoids any treaties with the Habsburgs, uh, even to the point that he ignores the Habsburg ambassador in Paris, uh, lies to him and undermines any efforts by the Habsburgs to uh, agree a treaty by the end of the 1780s. So it is really for Jefferson that we have to blame uh, this in initial um, stillbirth of uh, US Habsburg relations. Uh, I won't uh, end this um, section without saying that there's a level of irony in Jefferson's actions because uh, when he becomes um, a retired man um, at the end of his uh, Secretary of, of Stateship in uh, the 1780s and uh, sorry, 1790s, and before he is elected president, he returns to Monticello to build his house. And for this, he uh, uses a great deal, around 1,600 panes of bohemian glass. Uh, he prefers to use bohemian glass over other glass types and, and other national um, producers uh, because of its quality, because it was very clear and it was also very durable. So the dome of Monticello has a, a rather large glass cupola and this is made of Bohemian glass, and uh, Jefferson had to import this glass uh, from Bohemia via Hamburg. And because of this uh, long distance and the many tolls between Bohemia and Hamburg, he a rather, paid a rather heavy price for the glass. The same for his neighbor, James Madison, who also imported Bohemian glass for his house. The same for Henry Latrobe, who used Bohemian glass in the White House and the US Capitol building. So uh, all these early American leaders in a sense, paid the price of Jefferson's deception. My final um, section then uh, for the last uh, 10 minutes or so uh, has to do then with the ideas of the American Revolution and its sort of intellectual spectacle, as well as its ideological impact uh, in the Habsburg lands. Now, this is a rather broad topic, of course, and uh, I want to focus um, on the Habsburgs uh, and their reactions to the American Revolution. 
And before I turn to the Hapswood family and their, um, their position towards the American Revolution as a, an intellectual moment, uh, it's important to discuss Benjamin Franklin and his role in this uh, intellectual impact. Franklin uh, was really the public face of the American Revolution. He was by far the most recognizable American for many Europeans uh, at the time of the revolution. And as a uh, early proponent, and then later as an ambassador in France, he became in effect the, uh, the most recognizable uh, American revolutionary for most Europeans. This is dem demonstrable in the Hapsug lands, uh, based upon the number of letters that he received, or the extant letters, I should say, that he received. Uh, he had over 250 letters from over 100 people um, in the Hapsug monarchy sent to him. Uh, these, again, are just the letters that have survived, and you can see uh, the sort of network map of those presented on the top left, and they give you also a good impression that they came from all over the Hatsud lands, especially from the Austrian Netherlands, where many merchants wrote, but also in places like Videsh in uh, modern-day Slovenia, in uh, uh, the military Grenze in, uh, in uh, Lower Hungary, and as well as many other uh, rural and uh, non-metropole areas in the Hatsud lands. And I go into great detail again about these letters in the book because you have a fantastic array of school teachers and uh, courtiers and so on writing to him for all sorts of reasons. One important thing then to mention about Franklin and his connection with Maps of Lands is his great friend Dr. Jan Igenhaus. Uh, Igenhaus is a, um, is a scientist, they've known each other for many years uh, during their times in London. And Egan House comes to Vienna to inoculate the imperial family and stays there as a very respected uh, scientist and uh, physician. He is most known to us today as the discoverer of photosynthesis, but I think he also deserves great credit for his partisanship in the American Revolution. He is the great defender of Franklin, as well as being the uh, number one uh, distributor of Americana in Vienna. And you see this on the right. This is his handwritten uh, remarks of the affairs present de l'Amérique-Septimel, uh, a account of the American War of Independence, where he defends the actions of Franklin um, for a Habsburg audience. And I say a Habsburg audience because uh, his works disseminated from uh, around the court, but also beyond the court. Um, but in particular, he wrote and translated uh, works by Franklin um, and on behalf of Franklin uh, for the Empress Maria Theresa. And she read many letters then that were uh, written by Franklin, translated by Egenhaus, and delivered to her through her secretary. So uh, Franklin, in a sense, had a direct line to that so monarch, uh, unlike any other court in Europe. It's a very significant uh, connection. Uh, turning then to uh, Joseph II, who is depicted here on the left, visiting uh, his relatives, his sister Marie Antoinette, the Queen of France, along with uh, King Louis. Um, Joseph II has a particularly interesting position uh, in regards to the American Revolution, since he is, uh, of course, uh, later the sole monarch of the House of Monarchy, and he is someone who is rather irritated throughout um, by the troubles caused by the war, but he is someone who is quite intellectually curious about the American Revolution. And indeed, in many cases, he shows a level of sympathy towards the American rev revolutionaries particularly in his correspondence with Catherine the Great of Russia later on. Uh, in 1777, as you can see depicted, he visits uh, the court of France, um, ostensibly to help his sister and brother-in-law uh, in conceiving a child. But during that visit, uh, Joseph II uh, desires to meet a number of luminaries. So he has a list of people who he wants to meet in Paris. On that list is uh, Benjamin Franklin. And so a hot chocolate meeting is arranged between uh, him and Franklin through the Tuscan uh, envoy to uh, the court of France. Now, this is again another reason why the Tuscans are quite important in this story. And so Franklin and Joseph II are both invited at the same time to a hot chocolate. Um, Franklin turns up, he waits for a while and then departs after roughly half an hour, uh, noting that the emperor never showed up. And the emperor did not show up because of the British. The British undermined his uh, plans for that day by stalling him because they knew from their spies within Franklin's um, delegation that he was due to meet him and they could not allow the emperor in 1777, so early on in the war, to meet with the most famous revolutionary. It would lend him legitimacy and they could not allow that. But the episode demonstrates again Joseph's interest in uh, the American revolutionary cause and its people. 
The same thing goes for his brother, uh, Leopold, uh, later the, the, the uh, Emperor Leopold II, his successor. At that time, Leopold is the Grand Duke of Tuscany in his own right. And in Tuscany, he develops uh, ideas for a new constitutional system, a new sort of legal code enshrined in the rights of the people. Uh, it's a rather modern um, constitutional project by today's standards, or by, by sorry, by contemporary standards. And uh, Leopold indeed uh, studies many um, examples of constitutions from that period. Foremost among them is the uh, the, con the constitution of Pennsylvania, which he takes as one of his models for his own constitutional project. And I put the quote here uh, from his own notes on the constitution of Pennsylvania, where he writes, what I ask is that in order to make a good legal code in all states, even in monarchies, one must begin with the principle posed by the Americans, the principle of equality. So Leopold, uh, the brother of the emperor, uh, also has a rather um, sort of indelible impression of the American revolutionary cause and its principles. Finally, turning to some other characters outside of the Habsburg dynasty and in their monarchy in total, uh, there is a uh, professor of universal history at uh, the, at the um, College of, uh, of Kozice in uh, modern day Slovakia, then in Eastern Hungary. And uh, this uh, professor of universal history goes by the name of Johann Zinner. Uh, he is particularly interested in the American Revolution, not only because of his role as a history professor and as an academic, but also because he feels very deeply connected with the American cause. Uh, he travels uh, to meet William Lee in 1778, the American envoy, misses him by a few weeks, and so instead writes to uh, Franklin in order to obtain the materials that he wants to write uh, books about the American Revolution. Uh, his uh, only published book on the American Revolution appears in 1782. It's entitled uh, Remarkable Letters and Writings of the Famous Generals in America. It includes not only American generals, but also British generals and their writings along with biographies. But Zinner um, gave, gives a more favorable impression of the Americans throughout this work. He uh, in many ways shows the British in a bad light. Uh, the work also contains many more writings of the Americans um, thanks to his uh, help from Franklin, who gives him many uh, original documents to work with. Zinner also wrote to Franklin uh, numerous points and said that he was working on other works about the American Revolution. Uh, for a long time, these were considered lost um, by historians and scholars, but I was fortunate, uh, and again, thanks to um, foundations like Bochtieber, to find uh, the original manuscripts in the uh, local library in Kozice in Slovakia. And uh, these are two of those uh, works, for example, his Notitia Historica, written in Latin, uh, which chronicles the uh, founding of America, or the discovery of America from Columbus up until the revolution. And then in 1784, his handwritten Besuch an der Kriegsgeschichte der Verbündeten Staaten von Nordamerika, his uh, attempt at a military history of the United States of North America. Uh, these books are both written in by hand, uh, one in Latin, one in German. Uh, by Zinner, uh, they went unpublished. Uh, the Latin edition seems to be uh, mainly notes for his lectures, perhaps on universal history. And the book on the right seems to be something which he uh, had not published during his lifetime. Um, but both books are rather detailed uh, in their accounts of uh, Uni the United States and its war, as well as its history. And they represent really some of the earliest um, histories of the United States written by a a uh, Hungarian scholar uh, during the same period. So they're rather remarkable works in their own rights as well. Finally, I'd like to then uh, end with um, the reasoning why Zinner wrote these works. We have a very uh, good uh, idea of why he wrote these works given his letters to Franklin. And I think it's worth me reading out uh, both these quotes because of the impact and the power behind his words. So already um, on the eve of uh, Starting these works, he writes to Franklin in 1778, I was born the subject of a great monarch and under, whose, and under a government whose rule is mild, but I cannot tell you what joy I feel when I hear or read of your progress in America. To speak the truth, I look upon you and all the chiefs of your new republic as angels sent by heaven to guide and comfort the human race. And to give public manifestation of this sentiment, I am composing these works. And then the same uh, ethos, the same reason um, behind his... Uh, 
his uh, spirit to write these works uh, goes on to 1783. When he writes again to Franklin, uh, this is also a dedication as such to the US Congress, he writes, the people of America founded a new and prosperous republic, which is your glory in the new world. This is what amazes all peoples, even the far away peoples, perhaps hinting at the, the haps of subjects. Uh, this is what moves me most, that I pass on your young origin, your tireless work for freedom and, and the memory that I record the outstanding public announcement of your fame with writings. Onwards, you most excellent men, your name as an example of my fully devoted vigilance, follow the counsel of the just and the good, and you will be held by me with the most glorious praise for those who seek renewal. So it's a very clear distillation here of Zinner's reasons to compose these works and his utter praise for the American Republic. And, and in total, this is also a good demonstration of the wider appeal of the American cause in the Hapsic lands, which only increases uh, throughout the uh, 19th century. And on that note, then I would like to uh, finish my summary of the book and uh, to thank you all for your attention. And I welcome any questions you might have uh, in, in a discussion round. So thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. This was a very concise uh, uh, summary of your dissertation and book. I actually am more familiar with the dissertation than the book. Uh, and the dissertation, of course, it didn't have uh, the stuff in the first chapter about the pre-revolutionary contacts, uh, but that's a different story. So what I think is the significance of your work is that you show how in the public, not only among courtiers and people like uh, Leopold and Joseph himself, uh, the American Revolution was quite admired and popular. So a lot of support, uh, which is sort of surprising given how the story ends that uh, Habsburg does not have relations with the United States until uh, 1838. So in other words, the efforts by Lee, by Belen Berthold, uh, they're all for naught uh, uh, because of people like Jefferson not wanting those kinds of contacts as you, as you told us. So my question to you would be this, uh, you essentially argue I mean, the, it always has been interpreted that U.S.-Austrian relations couldn't really amount to much because Habsburg was such a reactionary court and such a reactionary land. And you seem to question that notion, how reactionary Habsburg was, with all your evidence showing that indeed it was different. So could you sort of reflect a bit on why Habsburg was not as reactionary as it has often been portrayed? Thank you. Um, thanks again for your remarks. And that's indeed a very, very good question. Uh, I think of it like this, that in the time before the French Revolution, the American Revolution was not a bad thing. Um, it was not something that uh, had created tumult and chaos in the world. It was in many ways a civil war within the British Empire. And so for many onlookers, uh, this was something to be supported and cheered. And then, of course, there's the economic uh, fallout of this. So for the Habsburg lands, there is a good positive uh, economic consequence of the American Revolution. And so it's for those two reasons, the sort of neutral or positive meaning of the revolution before the bloody terror of the French Revolution, as well as the positive effects of the economic uh, consequences of the war of independence that mean that many in the Habsburg lands see this as something positive and something to be supported. I think the interesting thing to reflect on here is that you could be a monarchist at this time and still support uh, these American revolutionaries. Because again, I think there's an understanding of the principles of the American Revolution in terms of freedom and liberty and so on, but not in an explicit sense that this meant an anti-monarchical position. Um, so for many people in the Habsburg lands, it was simply about uh, fighting for rights and uh, for legal justice and this, of course, they supported um, wholly as well. Um, I think, as you point out um, uh, in the book as well, uh, this is a very significant moment in the overall uh, relationship between Central Europe and uh, America. When I was uh, able to write the book from the dissertation, I took the opportunity then to expand it in many different ways, to include Tuscany and to deepen um, my uh, arguments and to deepen my examples uh, in many places. Um, but I also wanted to situate the revolution uh, in the long durée of um, 
sort of Central Europe and North America's relations. And so it's that reason, as you said, I included that first chapter going from uh, what was the meaning of the American Revolution, uh, sorry, what was the meaning of America um, from the time of Columbus up until the revolution in the Habsburg mind, as I put it. Um, and so in that sense, the revolution is this very important moment um, because it leads to the first attempts uh, of these revolutions. And then in the 19th century, it is the residue of revolution. It is the after thought of revolution that permeates still in the Habsburg lands, uh, these ideas of liberty, these ideas of justice and uh, natural rights and so on like this. And this flares up, of course, uh, as you well know, in the 1848 revolutions and beyond. So it's a very important um, moment then in the larger transatlantic picture as well. So um, that would be my, my long answer. And again, to come back to your, your question and, and again to offer you a succinct point, it's the, the economic vitality of the revolution combined with the fact that this is before the French Revolution. After the French Revolution, it's a very much different picture. And I'm happy to discuss that as well if needed. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. So the, the floor is open to questions. Who's got questions? Yeah, Andrea, my colleague, Andrea Mosterman, uh, Jonathan. She's actually Dutch and teaches uh, the revolutionary period here. <laughs> You're fine. <laughs> Thank you so much for your talk. That was really, really interesting, um, especially as a European, you know, studying early American history. Um, it was really great to, to kind of hear more about, about that part of the war and, and, and everything. Um, it's funny, too, what you just said is, is, you know, the way that people in Austria responded to the um, American Revolution, at least initially, um, thinking about it in the context of the Dutch having fought, you know, their war of independence against the Habsburgs. Um, so, you know, it, it's interesting if you look at, like for me, looking at Austria and Netherlands right away, I'm like, wait, why would they not want to, like, why would this not inspire them to fight for their independence, you know? So, um, but in any case, I'm, I'm especially interested in hearing a little bit more about the, um, the debates, uh, if there were any, um, about slavery uh, in, in, the colonies and, and the United States and how um, people in the Habsburg Empire, um, you know, thought about that, how they approached that, what were some of their their um, positions on that. Uh, I'd love to hear more about that. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. Well, that's a very important topic, of course, that you raise. Um, I'll be very honest, actually, uh, when I embarked upon this project, I thought immediately that two um, topics would be of great importance, religion and slavery. And as I uh, embarked upon it, as I worked on this topic for a number of years, I found out that really those two topics play a rather marginal role or uh, a role that is far less than what we'd expect um, in, in the first case. Um, in terms of slavery, uh, this comes up uh, only in the sense of um, Austrians who are, or say Habsburg subjects who are in North America. So there are a number of um, Austrian subjects or, or Habsburg subjects who join the Hessians, who are conscripted into the Hessians. They join for economic reasons and so on like this. Uh, they fight in North America, in the colonies, of course, and they are confronted with um, the you know, horrors of slavery. And then many of them return later on uh, to their villages and to their, their regions in Central Europe, and they bring with them then these experiences and these first-hand accounts of slavery. So there is only that sort of, say, uh, second-hand or limited uh, connection uh, in terms of that. The idea of slavery is not very uh, present at all um, in any sort of um, official diplomatic or uh, political dialogue. It only appears really in Berlin Berthoff's reports um, about American society and culture and economics. Um, but again, with an idea of um, this means that cotton or, you know, at that time indigo and so on are produced more cheaply. It, it doesn't really um, come out as a, a social criticism or anything like that. Um, and again, we might think that's rather surprising, but it's, it's uh, just the limited nature of their interests. One interesting thing to say about it, though, is that um, Balin especially uses the, the idea of slavery and the term of slavery for the Germans and the uh, Habsburg subjects who are migrating to America, especially in the 1780s. And this is particularly the case also with the consul, the Austrian consul in London, who is very critical of the Americans, uh, as he sees it, stealing uh, the workforce from Europe. 
and making them live in pretty squalid conditions. Um, so both these men, the Austrian consul, as well as Balin as a consul in, in Philadelphia, um, deplore the inhumane conditions of um, migrants to America, um, you know, attacking really the idea of an American dream and equating it in many times, in many reports, um, with uh, the conditions of slavery. So thinking of them as, as, as slaves in all but name. So that's, that's where I was um, also myself rather taken back by that, because I did think that there would be these considerations. The same as I thought that there would be a consideration of America as a Protestant nation, or was it largely Protestant nation, and you know the Catholics ha Habsburgs taking some difference with this, um, but both these um, these themes as such played a rather minimal role, which which is surprising perhaps to all of us. So thank you very much for that question, and happy to answer more if you have. Thank you. And just a side note, did you work with Nadine similarly? At yes, she was my okay, my awesome. To her at UVA, so I was very very fortunate to have her. Yeah. Yeah, she's amazing. Just. Nadine. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, Mark, my uh, our associate director has a question, Jonathan. Yeah. Dr. Landry. Thank you, Gunther. Yes. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Really, really uh, excellent talk. Very interesting. I have so many questions, but I, I guess I'll narrow it to to two. Um, what the the second one is sort of uh, more just a, a, a very brief question, but uh, I was kind of fascinated by your talk about um, Jefferson's stance on Joseph, Joseph II, right? Because uh, Joseph II is often taught as being, you know, an enlightened uh, despot, uh, you know, and, and somebody who was, was, was very much uh, a disciple of the enlightenment. Um, and so I wondered uh, if, if in your research, you know, you came across any more details you could give on Jefferson's stances towards Joseph II. Was he not supportive of, of the enlightened aspects of, of Joseph's policies or also, you know, Joseph thinking about Jefferson? It, it, they would seem to be people that would get along or, or would admire each other in some ways, but you said he, Jefferson kind of thought of Joseph II as, as chaotic more than than anything. So uh, that would be the, the main question. And then, um, uh, I, I wanted to ask, you said Balin died, did he die of yellow fever in, in Philadelphia? Yeah, uh, I'm, 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 I'm curious because I'm teaching a course on plagues and pandemics this semester, and I'm also working on a, a, a volume of contemporary Austrian studies related to pandemics in Austrian history. So uh, that would be a really uh, interesting thing to, to know then that, that Habsburg subjects were, were dealing with these epidemics in the new world, so. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, that's, that's two great questions. I'll just start with the Balin one because it's um, fresh and, and perhaps easiest to tackle. Um, two interesting things. So yes, as I as far as I remember, it's it's yellow fever in eighteen oh eight. But you have to you have to check my book because I'm I'm uh, I'm forgetting if it is actually a yellow fever. But it is a it is an epidemic that's going around. His wife succumbs to it a few months beforehand, um, and they are deathly afraid of it. Um, and then he he dies in in the early winter of, of 1808. So um, I believe it's yellow fever. If not, it's some other infectious disease uh, for certain. Um, the other thing I'd like to say about Balin and these diseases that might be of interest for you is that when he arrives in 1783, um, in September, I believe, 1783, um, as you might well know, there was also an epidemic, yellow fever epidemic in Philadelphia then. And um, he, he almost very nearly dies of that. At least that's what he writes in his reports. Um, he seems to be a bit of a drama queen or king uh, <laughs> in some ways. You know, he, he often complains about his maladies uh, in, to his official uh, superiors uh, in his reports, but he, he really does almost die as soon as he gets there. Um, at least he's very sick for the first month or so. So that's another, um, another possible connection for you. Um, the other question then about um, Jefferson and uh, Joseph again, uh, really, really good question and uh, allows me to open up a lot more about that. Um, you're absolutely right in the sense of, you know, Joseph had this enlightened reputation and that extended to American conceptions of him. So uh, one thing to point out is that jo uh, Jefferson had a positive view of Joseph's um, patent of tolerance. So his, um, his tolerance of Jews and uh, other religions and minority religions in Habsburg lands. He thought this was something that was excellent. 
he thought this was um, uh, a great indicator of how things should go. Uh, and this also uh, played a role in his thinking then on the statute of freedom, religious freedom in Virginia. So Jefferson particularly lauded Joseph about that, um, you know, in the early 1780s. But my point is that this changes in a certain sense when he gets there uh, to Europe, uh, to France in 1784 and takes over from Franklin as ambassador, because this is Jefferson in his diplomatic thinking mode. And so he's really concerned primarily then uh, with his uh, work in politics and as an ambassador and forging these treaties. And that sort of overrides any vision he has then of Joseph being an enlightened person. And this is very clear to see in the letters. So where he does mention that Joseph is one of the, you know, one of the wise monarchs of the age in, in the early 1780s or in 1783, this is abruptly uh, changed in 1783, 84, when he's in France and he says, you know, he's a mad emperor to kind of quote him that he particularly insane in his dog days, as he puts it. So, you know, his view of, of Joseph has just changed irrevocably because of his actions um, on the geopolitics of Europe, uh, particularly the, the war with the Dutch in 1784, uh, and then the League of the Princes uh, in 1785, and then the course 1787 with the Turkish war. So Jefferson just, you know, builds up this negative view of him. Um, it, might also have a lot to do with Marie Antoinette and the criticism of her at court, uh, which Jefferson is also, you know, exposed to, uh, and this is also reaching a crescendo during this time as well. So I think it's this, you know, this general uh, atmosphere that turns um, uh, Jefferson anti-Joseph. Um, but you're very right to inquire about his earlier views of him, and indeed they are there, but they're just drowned out by the the chorus of hate later on. <laughs> yeah. But thanks okay. for your uh, permit me to ask the last question. By the way, I checked it out in your book, Jonathan. It's indeed yellow fever. Okay, uh, thank Leland you. <laughs> died from. Yeah, I, I did check it out. But my question is about Atlantic history, and I also asked this in the interest of Andrea, because she teaches a course in Atlantic history to our grad students. So I would say your book is sort of a classical case study of Atlantic history and the connections across the Atlantic. But then in your introduction, you say there is a general fatigue about Atlantic history. And I just wonder where that notion comes from. You know, I'm a student also of Bernard Balins, who was a great scholar on Atlantic history. And when he jumped onto it, it was a very vigorous branch of historical study. So tell us what your, where your ideas comes from there. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's a very good point to bring up uh, indeed. Um, I mean it in the same sense that, yes, the heyday of Atlantic history has sort of passed us by, sadly, um, even though there's still much more to do. Um, histories of the American Revolution in particular are now written from uh, increasingly continental um, or even global perspectives. And my book uh, fits into not just then the Atlantic mode, but also that wider internationalist uh, view on early America, um, vast early America, as it's often been phrased. So um, I don't, you know, attack Atlantic history in any way. I, I still very much support it, and I think uh, it has a very great meaning. Uh, it's purely to say that I, I see that the sort of fatigue has um, appeared over the, the last, say, 10 or so years within historiography, at least how I read it. And um, I do agree with you to some, to some extent that my work is um, sort of classic uh, Atlantic work, as you put it, um, but more in the way that um, whereas um, people like Palmer um, and people like that who, who wrote about the American Revolution and, and Europe, uh, I, I go a bit beyond, not just in terms of geography, um, by looking at Central Europe and, and more Eastern Europe, but also in the way that I see then um, economics and uh, politics being rather intertwined uh, along with ideas. So it's not just an ideological exchange, but it's also one that's deeply meshed with um, the uh, economics and uh, the commercialism of the time as well. So that's where I also try to uh, draw a line of distinction as well with my work is that I, I try to uh, take these strands, ones that I presented tonight and to bring them together as a whole in this work. So I hope you find a satisfactory answer. If not, I'm sure we can discuss it much more. Jonathan, I, I love the fact that you say tonight uh, because here it's still midday and ah, I will okay. have to end it here because I have to go to another building and teach a class at two o'clock. So we would like to thank you very much for your great presentation and for your concise answers to our questions. So I hope we still 
can get you uh, to New Orleans one of these days. Uh, maybe if you ever do the Von Baum project, I'd love to bring you here next time you're in the US and hopefully it will work out. So thank you very much. And thanks to everybody who listened into our talk. Thank you. Thank you and everybody. have a good day. Good thank evening. <laughs> good afternoon.